Okay, that is a pretty good shot. Let's start right here. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about a discovery of a very peculiar white dwarf. A white dwarf that, as you can see from this illustration right here, seems to be the smallest white dwarf we've ever discovered. Just a tiny bit bigger than our moon. And that is very unusual, because this kind of goes against a lot of previous assumptions about white dwarfs. But the recent paper that you can, as always, find in the description below goes through a lot of detail why this is an actual discovery and even explains what exactly is happening inside of this white dwarf to make it so peculiar. But I guess it's also important to try to understand why this is a mystery slash unusual discovery to begin with. But let's start with the idea of a white dwarf. What exactly is it? Well, first of all, the name itself, White Dwarf, simply refers to the idea of them being really, really small and for the most part producing white light. This is generally because they're just extremely hot. The one they just discovered is about 80,000 Kelvin, which would make it look sort of like this. But naturally, they do cool down over time and, of course, change their color. Almost a decade ago, NASA made this video showing us how White Dwarfs transform over time. And in this particular video, you'll see how it changes from being white to being yellow, to then being orange, eventually red, and then turns into what's known as a black dwarf. All of this is in billions of years though. And so for the most part, most white dwarfs have actually not reached this point just yet. Today we generally expect a white dwarf to reach the stage of a black dwarf in roughly around a trillion years at least. So none of them have gotten that far yet. This one right here you're looking at, this is our neighbor Sirius B. With the Sirius A being the big bright star next to me. And since approximately 97% of all of the stars in the Milky Way and most other galaxies are low mass stars that will eventually form white dwarfs at the end, we expect white dwarfs to be the most prominent star in the next few billions of years. Actually, no, not billions, trillions of years. And eventually that's pretty much going to be the last stars in the universe. And naturally, our sun is also going to become a white dwarf in approximately 6 to 7 billion years from now. But even now, we've discovered a few white dwarfs that kind of um, defy the expectations. Now, first of all, it's important to understand how white dwarfs are able to exist to begin with. Now, for a typical star like our Sun, in order for it to not collapse into something smaller and in order for it not to become some sort of a really tiny object, there's a kind of an interplay going on on the inside where the thermal energy produced by the fusion of hydrogen essentially provides just enough outer pressure for the star not to collapse. And this of course happens until one day the sun is going to run out of hydrogen and start fusing something else. And this is of course why the size of stars changes as they age as well. But for white dwarfs, they actually depend on something completely different. They do depend on the ideas from quantum physics. The pressure that maintains their structure and prevents them from collapsing further comes from electrons. And more specifically, the idea known as the Pauli exclusion principle. With the main principle stating that the electrons cannot assume the same quantum state. In more simple terms, it just means that electrons cannot actually occupy the same space and have exactly the same properties. One of them will have to go somewhere else. But if there's nowhere else to go, they literally go outside. And so inside a typical white dwarf like Sirius B right here, what we can actually find on the inside is what some scientists sometimes refer to as the electron C. Basically because the atoms start to kind of compress so much that a lot of electrons inside of them come really close together and start occupying the same quantum state, those electrons get kicked out to the outside and create a very unusual state of electrons freely moving around but also providing enough external pressure to prevent this object from collapsing even further. But the very unusual thing about white dwarfs is that as they gain more mass, the things become compressed even more which forces even more electrons to enter this ocean of electrons, thus decreasing the total size of the white dwarf. Or in other terms, as a typical white dwarf gains mass, it actually decreases in size, like series B right here. But there's a limit to that, and this limit was discovered a long, long time ago by a famous Indian mathematician, Subramanian Chandrasekhar. It's known as the Chandrasekhar limit. At some point, even the electrons can no longer support all of the mass. This normally happens when the electrons are forced to move close to the speed of light. At this point, the white dwarf collapses and basically explodes. This is what we refer to as the famous Type 1a supernova. Probably the most useful supernova in a lot of different astronomical studies. So anyway, back to white dwarfs. Up until this point, all of the white dwarfs, even the most massive ones we've ever discovered, were generally around the same size as planet Earth. For example, here's an actual size of Sirius B compared to planet Earth. 
and it's already almost one mass of the Sun, so not that far off from that Chandrasekhar limit. And to date, most of the other white dwarfs discovered were not really that small. They were massive, there are some actually massive ones discovered so far, but for most of them they were just a little bit too far away to discover their actual size, and in some cases there was just not enough data. But this particular white dwarf is close enough for the scientists to collect a lot of data about it. And what they got from the observations from various telescopes, including the Gaia telescope, is that it's the smallest, most likely the most massive, and also extremely highly magnetic, and overall just really, really strange. And so first of all, in terms of the size comparison, here is what it sort of looks like, with the name actually listed right here, compared to our planet and compared to our moon. And because of its tiny size and temperature of about 80,000 degrees here, this only means one thing. It's gotta be extremely massive, way more massive than anything we've seen so far. Now the mass currently is believed to be about 1.36 masses of our sun, maybe a little bit smaller than that. And that's just before it should technically go supernova. The previously mentioned Chandrasekhar limit is roughly around 1.37 to maybe about 1.44, depending on what the white dwarf is made out of. On top of this, it also spins really fast. A single rotation here takes approximately 7 minutes, and this is one of the fastest spinning white dwarfs out there. The record holder has a spin of about 5 minutes, but normally for a white dwarf, a spin would be in hours, not actually minutes. On top of this, it also seems to be extremely magnetized, very, very high magnetic field here. The field is reported to be approximately 900 mega gauss, which is billions of times higher than the magnetic field of planet Earth. And so altogether, all of these observations sort of suggest one thing. All of these observations suggest that this is a result of a collision between two smaller white dwarfs. The white dwarfs that were supposed to produce a supernova once they collided, but in the end, instead of exploding, they created a fast-spinning, super highly energized and relatively massive smaller object that was most likely created approximately 100 million years ago. Although it's still not entirely clear if it's going to be able to survive for much longer. If it actually slows down a little bit more, it's possible that the centrifugal forces will cause some of the material on the inside to reshuffle and might actually destabilize the white dwarf. So it still has a chance of going supernova in the future. On the other hand, it's quite possible that something else is happening on the inside and it's already stable and it's going to stay stable like this for the next few trillion years. In other words, it's very difficult to currently predict what's going to happen to this object. Now, normally in a typical white dwarf, even as it sort of stays stable mass-wise, some of the elements on the inside can still actually steal some of the electrons. Or in other words, some of the heavier elements can actually reacquire the electrons that are preventing the object from collapsing and thus cause the white dwarf to finally collapse and explode as a supernova. And so one of the potential explanations here is that maybe the heavier elements just didn't really get to settle on the bottom yet. And once they do and once they start capturing the electrons, that's when the Chandrasekhar limit is going to be reached and that's when the white dwarf will go supernova. But if the white dwarf cools down just enough, the inside of the white dwarf will start crystallizing. And if it manages to crystallize in time, it's never going to explode as a supernova and will actually stay as a white dwarf. In order to successfully crystallize, it just has to survive for maybe 10 to possibly 100 million years more. Although honestly, no one really knows because there are a lot of different predictions and a lot of different explanations in regards to these white dwarfs. And so in that sense, this object is still very mysterious and extremely interesting. At a distance of 134 light years away from us, it's also close enough for further investigations, and so it's quite likely that there are going to be more studies coming out about this, possibly discovering something else really mysterious and really unusual. But I guess until we learn more or until further studies, that's kind of all I wanted to mention in this video. Check out some of the other studies and some of the other videos in the description below. Maybe subscribe, maybe share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Also, maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining a channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.